Shut up, compressor. Hey everyone, Matt here with Deuce Models, and in this video, I want to talk about 3D printing, and in particular, two use cases that I've kind of run up against recently that I just don't feel really get a lot of coverage in the bigger 3D printing discussion. And before I get into it, I have to apologize for the somewhat potato quality of the video. I'm recording this on my computer because I'm just too lazy to realign the camera because it's in the middle of filming all the F4 shit. So it is what it is. Uh, yeah, you don't need 4K quality for my face. So let's talk about 3D printing. Now, over the past, I don't know, year, year and a half or so that I've been dabbling in 3D printing, there have been a lot of different discussions. There have been things about, you know, 3D printing isn't really modeling, 3D design isn't really modeling, it isn't really, you know, it isn't the same as scratch building, which, yeah, you're, you know, you're doing something digitally versus physically. Fine, whatever. And there's the perennial, oh my god, 3D printing is going to completely take over modeling, and we're not going to buy kits anymore, you'll just download something and print it. And for injection molded kits, I, I really don't see that happening anytime soon. Uh, it just... The quality control of printing and the engineering and fit of parts and things, it's just, it, it's really challenging. I think it might come to pass for maybe like lesser known tanks. I think it's really unlikely for aircraft though. But basically I kind of stick with my original feelings on this, which is 3D printing is going to completely take over whatever is made in resin right now. So, aircraft tires, I think stowage will go this way. I think basically the entire figure market, I think, is hopefully going to go 3D printed uh, at some point. And that's what it will be. But there are a couple of things that I've been experiencing recently that I think are really interesting when you start kind of thinking through the implications. So the first of them is this T10 mine exploder I've been working on since, I don't know, sometime late last year. Basically, the T-10 was an M4A2 Sherman that they pulled off the production line or, you know, out of a depot or something like that, and they stuck just giant-ass mine rollers on it. Two big ones on the front, and then, like, a rear frame kind of dragging a third sort of wheel assembly behind it. And this is the most ridiculous-looking Sherman you've probably ever seen. Uh, it... Even from my non-engineer mind looking at it, it just seems completely unworkable and completely poorly thought out. Like, how the fuck does it turn <laughs> without destroying itself? Uh, yeah, okay, great. So it's heavy and slow, and it rolls over a mine, and it blows up one of the wheels, and then what? It's got a bunch of extra giant wheels lying around. Like, it, you know, and there's also a high likelihood it destroys the actual mounting systems in the enter it just again it seems dumb and it's also the super dumb idea of making a sherman tank front wheel drive with a bunch of little giant pizza cutters essentially for wheels like the ground pressure argument just does not hold up so it's dumb it's stupid but there is a resin conversion out there for it made by bold division now i sucked it up and bought this thing and it's got some nice elements. Like, I, I do like the the actual, like, rims of the main wheels. I do like that, you know, you get, like, all the little uh, pizza cutters for the rear. The You know, that stuff is fantastic. The wheels themselves and a lot of the parts seem somewhat questionably thought through in terms of engineering. Like, the main wheels you have just essentially, like, a big cylinder with a couple of ridges around the outside. And then you've got 30, 40 some odd splines that you have to then butt join glue into that thing around the circumference. And then you have to drill like a five millimeter hole through it. And there's like a little dimple where it, just, it's, it seems like they're basically intending just a, a shitload of work to make it happen. Work that I don't think is really necessary because I just don't think that wheel is designed very well, especially when 3D printing is the thing. Which is why, for the most part, I've basically looked at the Bold Division stuff and thought, there's a better way to do this, and gone into Fusion 360 and just whipped up parts. 
So the wheels, the front sort of axle housing, the cleaning stars that go behind the wheels, the box that holds those, like even the uh, you know even the various frame mounts that are pretty simple, I've gone in and rethought. You know, in terms of like the rear frame assembly is just this big thing that hangs out the back of the Sherman, right? And there are two elements that kind of bolt onto the side. And with the resin parts, you just kind of glue them. You just find, figure out where they fit and glue them. And so what I did is I took, you know, the basic shape. It's basically just like, you know, a flat piece and like a, another flat, beefier flat piece on the bottom with a hole in it where the frame goes in. Like, it's not that complicated. But then I made two parts. I made one that had pins extending out, and then I made another part that basically just erased those pins and just punched a hole straight through the flat part so I could hold it up against the frame, drill the holes, and boom, I've got a press fit part. So instead of having to deal with like tape that doesn't hold it very well because of the weight of everything, I can just push these parts in and everything holds. Great, right? But what this got me thinking of is there are a bunch of resin sets out there that not only are they expensive, which is its own thing. I'm gonna ignore that. Let's pretend they're all five dollars, right? But once they sell out, or even before they sell out, they these things can be just unobtainium. Like, you know, good luck finding them just to even purchase and to use. And then when you do find them and purchase them, you basically get to use them once, and that's it. There's no like, oh, I fucked this up. I'll go buy another one. Or, oh, I've got another thing in mind, like a diorama idea. And I'll just go pick up another one of these and do that too because I've got experience with it. You know, you can't. It's it's a very supply-limited sector. And what 3D printing lets you do is it lets you get that shit, basically. You know, and I'm sure in five years, you will not be able to find the Bold, Div Bold Division T10 set. It will just be gone. Everybody who has ever bought one will buy it. Every store that's ever stocked it will have sold it, and it will just be gone. I don't think there's a huge demand, I don't, you know, in terms of, like, pumping these things out of molds all the time to keep up with it. And, you know, you look at, like, a bunch of the cutting-edge stuff, or, I mean, hell, even these days, like, the true detail seats that I used in my Intruder, I get messages from people frequently asking where can I get those and it's like 2016 I, I don't know what to tell you like squadron folded tree details folded the molds are out there somewhere but they're not currently in production good luck finding it but if there were STL files of those ejection seats you could just buy those and print your own seats cool you'd have the you'd be able to do intruders as long as you wanted that'd be fantastic and I kind of think Outside of the, you know, Edward and Aries and Quick Boost and the ones that just keep pumping shit out all the time, and especially those bigger conversion sets, those are basically you see them, you buy them. That's it. And after that, they're gone. You can't find them. Tough shit. Unless you luck out somewhere, you know, some vendor to model contest happens to have one in like a giant plastic box with a bunch of other shit. Having these things as 3D printed sets, or even better, as STLs that you can purchase and print yourself, keeps them in circulation longer, gives the opportunity to buy these things later down the road. You know, like Fanch Lubin right now is making all kinds of amazing stuff for his 132nd F7F Tiger Cat. I mean, we've got you know, Pratt & Whitney R2800s, we've got fuel tanks, we've got wheels. It just so happens that a lot of this stuff is pretty common with a... Uh, aircraft that I'm thinking about spinning up here in the near future. It was a plan for this year, but <laughs> this year is an absolute fucking mess. So maybe not, but I'll be able to take the engine, the wheels, things like that, and use them on that. And cool, you know, it's great, right? Gets to stick around. So yeah, that's one use case that I don't think is really covered enough is the lack of availability of aftermarket sets after kind of like a certain period in time. They're just gone. And you cannot get them, and you cannot even use them, even if you want to, even if they suck, and you're willing to put in the work to make them work. You just can't get them. Tough shit, right? So 3D printing extends that, and it gives you the option also to, you know, improve parts, kind of 
assemble things together digitally if you want to, maybe tweak them, even though tweaking STL is a whole different game, but super useful. And I think right now, like, you know, there's all the popularity of things like light guards for Sherman tanks. And yeah, it's cool that you can plop down, you know, 20 bucks and get enough to do, you know, four or five Shermans. That's great. What happens if those companies stop making that or, it, you know, kind of like disappears? And that is where, again, the ability to purchase those as STL files for, hell, I would pay 20 bucks for those STL files just to have them and hold on to them because I will build more Shermans, I guarantee you. And to not have to try to hunt down obscure aftermarket several years after its release would be quite welcome. So that's the first thing. The second thing is I have lately been working on not sucking at figures. And to be fair, I still very much do suck at figures. Uh, this is a Bold Miniatures Lilith bust. I apologize for the lighting. This is all backlit. But this is kind of my first serious go at like not sucking at skin tones and things like that. And I learned a lot, and I learned a lot of what to do, and I le learned a lot of what not to do. But this is a 3D print. This is not the actual know, $50, $60 resin bust. This is just a 3D print. And I have the resin bust sitting in there, but I don't want to commit to it when I suck at figures. I want to figure figures out before I really start committing to those things that like once you buy them and they sell out, you can never buy them again. With these, you can print them again and again and again. So I've got Lilith's friend here. Uh, I believe this is Vesha. Another, this is actually a failed print. There's some, uh, there's some air gaps in here around her neck and the fur collar. And so I'm using this again as a learning what the fuck I'm doing piece. And just to kind of keep going with that, you know, it's like, you look in here closely, like, the paint's a bit thick, the eyes aren't, they're okay, they're not great. So, to practice and get a little bit better, I just throw that file into Mesh Mixer and chop the head off, and hey, look, we've got more 3D prints that I can use to practice and to get better, so that when I do get around to that resin piece that I also bought, I can do it some justice. And I can make more of these, as many as I want. And I can make them in different scales, which is pretty cool. So, for the figure basis, maybe it's just me. Maybe it's because I'm not all that, you know, all that well-versed in where you buy figures and busts and things like that. Um, Finding them and purchasing them in the first place is a huge issue. Like, oh, that's a cool figure. Where'd you get it? Oh, it was a limited run of 200 and it sold out five years ago. Tough. Like, that's basically what I run into. Or I run into, I want something in a larger scale. Like, honestly, even 75 millimeter figures feel, I don't know, a bit scrunched to me. Like, I, I want bigger than that if I'm going to commit that much time to painting something. It's kind of like 132nd aircraft versus like 172nd aircraft. And with 3D printing, you can do that. You can make these things significantly larger. Case in point. So, I don't know. It's, uh, it's a use case that I don't think gets enough attention, which is not only the ability to actually buy these things and then print them and experience them for yourself. And, you know, yes, like, I have the resin of these, of these three you know, there's, there's another one, a girl playing a guitar. Um, I like the, the whimsy. I like the, you know, the fact that it's like, they're just treated as normal people. This isn't like some, you know, metal bikini type fantasy figure. It's just a girl enjoying a beer, which is back over there. Um, you know, but once those sets are sold out, resin-wise, they're gone. But Bold Miniatures is still selling the STLs. So anybody who wants to get these things, even though the resin's gone... They can still get these, and that's pretty damn cool. And then the ability to like slice things up and just print practice pieces to improve and to not worry about throwing away a 60 or 70 or whatever dollar figure bust that you bought or figure that you bought because you fucked up the eyes or you fucked up your base coat. That's fantastic. I mean, that that's, you know, I think that in and of itself 
will sort of up the overall skill of figure painters because you have all these things to practice on and at any size that you want. So, it, you know, I mean, I could start with this bigger, this bigger head, kind of figure out what I'm doing on it, and then bring it down to this and, you know, figure out where I still need to maybe maintain a certain level of detail and where I can sort of, or where I might have to shorthand it a bit just because the scales are different. The, you know, amount of blending and shadow and whatnot that needs to go into this to make it look real. Maybe not into this as much. So, again, I have no idea what the fuck I'm doing with figures. Uh, that's why I'm printing all these things out to learn. So, you know, I think those are two things that speak very well to the potential of 3D printing. Not only to extend the market and the reach of the products that these artists are creating. I mean, these things, you know, again, these things are gorgeous. And... As somebody who creates shit myself, like personally, the the feeling of okay, well, you know, two hundred people could get it and that's it, or two hundred people could get it, but then you could still have the potential to have two million people get it and experience your stuff and work with your stuff. To me, that's a no brainer. That's like, yeah, of course, I, I would love to do that. I get that there's still, um, you know, there's still concerns over like piracy and file sharing and things like that. And honestly, I don't know what to do about that. I think at some point it's just going to have to be a accepted as part of the game and shame people who do it. And most modelers, I think, are fairly decent folks and want to reward creators for the stuff that they've done. So I would just honestly lean on that. Um, but again, you know, I'm... <laughs> I'm not actually in the production and sale of STL's business, so who the fuck am I to talk about that? But anyway, those are my thoughts on two sort of interesting, maybe less considered, less covered use cases. The ability to still access things years after they've been produced or been introduced, and the ability to practice and improve your skills with really very little downside. So that's it. Uh, hopefully I will get good enough at figures soon that I will be able to maybe make some videos and uh, show you all how to, how to suck at figures a little bit less as, as I figure out how to suck at figures a little bit less. Anyway, that's that. Hope you all are doing well and I will talk to you all later.